If Murray had supported the show, I'd be less sick of podcasts. Here America's Blah, blah, blah. The blah, blah, blah. Sending out good vibes. Shivers or vibrations and stuff like that. Okay, guys, welcome back to your America show. We are going to be chatting with Ian Williams a little bit later about soil and permaculture and stuff like that. And we got uh, Graham System Sounds Dunlop over here. Hey, buddy. How's it going? You could try mute system sounds. Yeah, I don't know. I'll figure it out. I just got sort of a new email program on my computer. So So how you doing? Not too bad. So you made the full jump to PC now? Your PC guy? Well, yeah. no, no, no. I mean, I just, uh, you know, I had the old laptop that I was using still for email and stuff. And I just, I ended up just sort of putting it all, but I need a new external drive and I need to buy some more hardware to support it. Doing too much uploading and downloading and videos and books. And like, it's just too much now, right? I, the, the computer I bought was for really not what I'm doing with it now. And it's, it's still good, but I the need PC. more memory. Need more memory, basically. Yeah, but I just have everything on there now. That's all. So I don't have to kind of go back and forth with mail. I just have it all on there. It's just a stupid little thing, but it helps. I'm, I'm going to get the new Apple at some point. The new Apple what? Yeah, I think because I got my old laptop and I don't really want a new laptop. Just get the glasses then. What? No. <laughs> I'm going to get, they got the little mini, you know, it's just like, you hook your monitors to it so I could literally just like flip a switch and have my two monitors be my Apple computer or one Apple and one PC and wow, stuff like that. Just because I, I, it's hard to use a laptop at my desk now. Now that I spend more time working at my desk and I have a regular keyboard and a mouse and my trackpad, that's all so much nicer to use than a laptop. That's exactly what I'm that's exactly why I did it. Yeah. So I got my eye on that. And the thing about that is like now you can get like the top of the line one, like the top of the line one for the ones they're selling at least, you know, it might not be as top of the line as some computers you're getting, but the top of the line little Apple mini, I think is like 1700 bucks Canadian, which is, I mean, the top of the line laptops, like $6,500. Yeah. That's crazy. If I like go through and like, you know, take all my dream settings, you know, terabyte fucking hard drive and 64 whatever is a memory. And next thing you know, fucking boom. Yeah, I mean, $6,300. Yeah, it's that's like, crazy. I can't afford that. That's like yeah. payments. That's like, I bought my first like six cars for less than that. <laughs> <laughs> and the goggles that just came out are like 3500 bucks. U.S. probably. What is that? Just like holding your iPhone real close to your face? I don't know, dude. They're virtual. It's like a augmented reality stuff. I mean, it's apparently it's like military grade. It's it's probably just, pretty no, good. They just what? Stick up on it. No one cares. No one cares, man. I'm telling you. And oh, the kids don't care. The VR. It's, it's not VR. It's it's augmented. They here's the problem. They didn't Whatever go VR. They didn't even make it scalable to VR. It's all AR. It's augmented. Well, to be honest, it's not compatible. Augmented reality might be better where the future is, where you could run in a field and like chase an imaginary woolly mammoth, hunt it, <laughs> something like that. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, like my kids, we have that VR still. And it was the top of the line at the time. You know, that thing wasn't cheap. Got it for him for Christmas not long ago, a couple years ago. And it was like, the best one was like the Oculus 2 or whatever. And they play it. You know, they don't not play it. But if you compare that to like the playing Minecraft or fucking those shitty little Roblox games and like, you know, like rudimentary 
like I don't know what the bit rate would be, but I swear it's like these games have the same graphics as the games I was playing. Some yeah, games, what's going on I, with that? It's, it's a fucking they're, they're retro and back. I mean, we just bought Lola Walkman. We didn't. No, we were gonna buy our Walkman, but her dad ended up getting for it. But we were like, I, I was actively looking for a Walkman, and they are not cheap. A yellow, like a yellow Walkman from the eighties, yeah. literally. Yeah, from the 80s. Because, because I think it's because of Stranger Things. All the kids want Walkman. Well I, well, I got a bunch of tape, old tapes. If you want to play some old Zeppelin and Pink Floyd on the oh, Walkman, yeah. oh yeah, I kept them all. Do you have a little have... table? Uh, no, I don't think so. I'll bring them over. And I'll let her pick through. Well, I don't. I don't know about that. Well, pick. I don't know. Pick a couple that you don't want. That you just like offer them off, and then you're like, no. Like maybe I'm some. Big... <laughs> some old grand. I didn't know you had you had the Walkman going. I mean, I could just here. I'll pick out some mixtapes. That's like super retro, right? The old mixtapes from that we made. That you made. Well, we were all making them back oh, then. What? Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Okay, yeah. So then we don't even know. You don't even know what it is. You find its way it onto the show. <laughs> <laughs> so, what an exciting day today! Why? What happened? This well, because disclosure is here, man. Disclosure two point is here. The disclosure conference. What? A the National Press Club event. Greer and Disclosure 2.0. I mean, it ha it's happening. Like, this is... Is that why you were crying this, today? Were you well, actually crying? I had I shed a little tear with Greer when Greer got a little emotional uh, on there. Yeah, uh, dude, you should have heard this guy's... No, no, no. Greer's dude, he's been had. Dude, you should have heard this guy's testimony. This wasn't about Greer. It's about the people coming forward. There's a whole new batch of whistleblowers coming forward to talk about this. I mean, Greer, Greer is talking about it's it's two types. There's the ET type, right? And then there's the other type, the the ARV. What's that? The alien replication vehicle, right? So, and he he's not talking. He's he's the one warning of a false flag of like a blue beam type operation. So he's he's talking about most of these sightings are ARVs. They're they're man made stuff, and he's got examples going way back, dude. He thinks they cracked gravity in. In 54, in October 1954. Is this new? No. Uh, I don't know if it's new or not, but this this Washington Press Club Disclosure 2.0 event was new. There was uh, six other witnesses that, that talked on there. I mean, this is unbelievable. They had a guy talking. He was back flying pilot. He was a pilot flying in the Korean War. He flew, he flew like a... <laughs> this. I think this I might be the... I can't. I just what? gotta stop you for a second. Why? Because it's very clearly a distraction for the fact that they're jailing their political opponents like communists. And by Dude, this has been go this has been in the works for decades. And busted being blackmailed. Yeah, it's been like sitting in the back pocket, the chest pocket of some fucking politician for decades. We're like, okay. <laughs> He's talking yeah. about the politicians that have had this and pushed it off to the back burner. Like you gotta watch the whole thing. You got what? It's a Greer thing. Yeah. Can't do it. I don't do, try. Well, I, I know. That's why you got to watch it, because it's about the people that are coming forward. But is it produced by Richard? Um, I, yeah, I guess. I mean, this is the All June right. 2023 National Press Club event, Disclosure 2.0. But remember, dude, remember when they had, like, how is that any more disclosure? than like the Senate hearings or whatever they were. That's well, because this this, this is more of the whistle this is more of a whistleblower type thing. They're coming forward. These guys are coming forward. He's got the so old disclosure document. There was none of that at the Bassett one. The Bassett one. Um was it Stephen Bassett that did it in front of Congress or whatever for a while back in the day he had like a few days of like no that was the that was so that's what I was gonna say. No, that was the original two thousand and one disclosure. That was in so May, I believe. Do? What? What it didn't Bassett do something? Well, he's yeah, he's been a huge political activist, but I, I can't. I, I just for yeah, UFOs. He, yeah, yeah, yeah. For UFOs, like he's the one that he was counting on Hillary to be the disclosure president, right? Um, 
So he's done a lot, but this is this is different. So this is so Greer's talking about 122 downed objects since 1945. So he's got he says there's retrieval, crash retrieval. So they're not all ET crash retrieval. There's some from the black budgets. Basically, they're saying there's a there's a clandestine black budget. Like it's like what we've talked what? about before, right? Wait, a it's, what? it's a clandestine <laughs> clandestine. Clandestine uh, private air force that's that's running this thing, right? Like they're they're not they're beyond all the governments of the world, right? And he's talking about this, and he's warning of the false flag. But some of these things that have been shot down are not ETs; they're some of these other vehicles, and they got to be there to retrieve them, right? Russian. Um, they're beyond national national borders. So the I'm first skeptical. guy, what? I'm skeptical. That's why you got to watch it. First of all, just like two weeks ago, on this very podcast, you were telling me how disclosure doesn't matter anymore because it's over and it's already happened and the people that are going to tell us don't matter anymore. And now you're, it's disclosure day. I mean, I'm just, I'm still a little off balance, I guess. Well, be, I, okay, it's because of what's happened also with with the the stuff that we talked about last on last week's show. Micah Hanks and the debrief talked about that that intelligence officer coming out and blowing the whistle. Now, this is Greer's own thing that is sort of pushing back against that government, or it's different, right? He's he's oh, got Hanks a whole he's what Hanks. I and can't Greer. hear it when you talk over me. Hanks I can't hear Greer. Or Greer, mm-hmm. Hanks was just covering Greer's thing. Or no, 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 no. Not even close. It's just completely related. separate thing. Completely unrelated. separate thing. So, so Greer's thing. He's got an outline of what he th- they they want the government to do. But he's got lawyers. They're going to sue them through the RICO charges. I mean, the it's it's pretty big. So Greer's pushing this at the same time as like these other guys. Maybe they're trying to get ahead of it. Like the the debrief whistleblower is trying to get ahead of it. So, I mean, he had these guys. So this old guy comes on. He was, he was, he had two UFO sightings. I think they were both in the Korean war, but one of them, like he, the, he, this craft was going from 70,000 feet to 12,500 feet in like two seconds. And then, you know, then he got, he got talked to that. He couldn't, he couldn't talk about this stuff. Like it's your typical kind of like UFO stuff where you're, you're sort of trying to, they're trying to swear you to secrecy. And he had a bunch of these, other issues going on. So there's two major UFO accounts there. Then this one, these one guy, six Navy guys stumbled across a, a UFO in Indonesia with some paramilitary people that had us that had better equipment than they did from the U S and there was a UFO there and they, they thought it was maybe smuggling drugs, but they were smuggling humans and they got, they got away. Kids. They they got away. I don't know if they. He didn't say kids. He just said it was like human smuggling on this UFO, and uh, and there was a Navy guy. And then they were again. They had to to meet with this this admiral guy that came up or some some high up dude, and they wanted him to sign sign an NDA. And this guy's coming forward. These guys are whistleblowers coming forward, and they're fucking genuine, dude. One guy was in, like was in tears because his dad was, uh, you know, like a, a contractor for the, the government. And then they took away everything that he had because they saw this fucking megalith and an underground dumb floating. That's all it was. And then they wanted them to sign an NDA because they went to measure this measure a, a workspace in an underground, um, a deep underground military base. And they saw this huge megalith, a hundred tons. They estimated it weighed floating. How, uh, ele- um, uh, what do you call it? Levitating. And there was another huge massive rock behind it levitating. This guy was spinning it around. Interesting. We should get and, Mike on. You should text and, him. I think and this, I, him. I did. I, he's, I, I congratulated him for his thing. So this guy was a you ranger were, huh? and he was, and he was sabotaged out of his jump by a guy. Like he, the guy, fine. the guy hit his, his line against yeah, his I, neck I, and, and stop listening. Why? Why? Well, I'm trying reply? to explain. This is know, my segment. Know, I'm trying to explain what's going on. Did you reply? Yeah, he said thanks. He misses us. Huh. Okay, carry on. So they they wanted to sign an NDA, and they wouldn't sign an NDA. They took everything away from his dad. Everything. So he's coming forward and whistleblowing. Then there's a guy. Get this. There's a guy in Antarctica, 
and he's responsible for the the facility in the Antarctica with the, with the National Science Foundation. This is back in 2010. So he's working for a third party. He knows that this is where the ice cube neutrinos are and stuff, and he he found out that there's faster than light communication going out of there. It's a it's a direct energy weapon platform. They've got an air traffic control station. They're tracking all this shit from Antarctica. When they when they when they lit this thing up to try and get it calibrated, they 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 generated uh, earthquakes on mis- by mistake, all halfway across the world. It's got a green laser that shoots into cosmos. Ooh, like Dave's. What? Like no, Dave's. this is like massive. Like it's, and then there's a. What else was there? Anyways, that's a that's just an example. Oh, there's a guy. I mean, so there's the, Mojave, there's the Mojave. There's the Mojave Desert one. Ooh. Yeah, this I knew you'd like this. This what? guy. So like segue. He's 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 watching this these crafts with Raytheon. These two Raytheon guys, and he's the voice of the desert. He's got control over the communications in the Mojave Desert range. It's the biggest test range live fire test range in the world or something. And this is a young guy who's got all kinds of commendations. He's got brain damage now. And he was with these Raytheon guys. And he saw these black fucking huge black triangles. One was like a, it looked like there was a hologram between the two crafts. And then he was coming back from the movies with his wife. He had a, like a, a pass when you go out and come back, right? Coming back, this oh, fucking man. UFO was on the road and he touched it. And it felt like it was alive and it purred and it fucking, it, his wife came out and they were stuck in this like plasma stasis, um, super emotional. And, uh, again, they're just, they're not saying this is ET. Like they say, this is Raytheon's technology. This is all today. This is all today. Like live today, there's 35,000 people watching it live. So. This is fucking fascinating because it's just another take on what's going on in the official government channels. Live on YouTube? Yeah. Something? Yeah, live on YouTube. YouTube. I don't know where else it was live, but it was on YouTube. Down. He talked about, uh, what's that? YouTube struck us down. We are currently suspended from YouTube and yeah. Facebook from let's going th- live. Let's talk about that in a sec. He talked about, obviously, peaceful contact. And he says they're peaceful. That's why they're not uh, punching back. But there was a whole bunch of uh, a whole bunch of media there too, and they were asking him questions at the end. He said even like they did a CE five with the government of France when Sarkozy was there, and they had shit happen with the government of France. Oh my God! Speaking of France, did you see the video of the like guard falling over dead and Macron just like? doesn't even care he's just still smiling for the but he's like dying like six feet away from him and he's just smiling for pictures <laughs> no one it really that. is just like uh a real sign of just how much yeah. they don't give a fuck yeah yeah exactly clubs, you know and then dude and then some guy runs out of the like parliament building and it looks like he's going to help him but he's actually just going to like Stand in front so the camera can't see, you know, to, to, oh my, no way. Obfuscate, or is that the right word? Obfuscate? Obfuscate, yeah, maybe. The, 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 the view, the view was seeing obstructed at the very least, to obstruct the view of, uh, that's terrible. You know, wow. yeah, right? Isn't that fucking crazy? I was just like, oh my God, they don't give a fuck. Like, cause you'd think that'd be even less like, political points to just run over and like are you help okay? the guy give him mouth to mouth i mean imagine the the, the political points are just doing like mouth to mouth right there i think yeah, i was in like ethiopia or something that was not gonna happen uh obfuscate to make obscure unclear or unintelligible so i think you know good usage proper usage are you done with your uh, UFO segment? I guess, yeah, yeah. So I'll put a link in the show notes to that. Everybody's got to watch it. Honestly, it's it's uh, um, whether you like Greer or not. He seemed nervous. He seemed genuine. He seemed emotional towards the end, of course, because that guy with his father, like, he, what a speech that was. But I mean, all these whistleblowers seem genuine to me. Like, I I really don't think these guys are making it up. It was a really good, broad selection of the of the cases. You know, you had. 
uh, personal contact in the, in the, in the desert. You had, um, underground base contact. You had, uh, flying, um, contact many, many decades ago, all kinds of really good cases. And these are all fresh, right? And then in the 2001 one, I mean, he talks about how all this information has been passed on to the government, you know, all like hundreds, hundreds of witnesses from 2001, some of them redacted, but hundreds not redacted as well. So. Well, I hate to say it, but I think we got to bring back the UFO segment for a little while. Yeah, maybe. Found UFO quotes. I lost it again. Son of a bitch. Found UFO quotes. Yeah, yeah, that's not the right yeah, one. Yeah. I get to delete all the Oh, my God. Okay. So support the show. All right. FDA slash support. Uh, if you guys are getting some value from a little podcast here, what is it like? Uh, 605, 606 episodes coming at you. All free, all there in the back catalog. There, if you just grab, download, listen to, share. If you're getting some value from those, if you're listening to the show on a regular basis, what's it worth to use? Is it a buck a month, two bucks a month, five bucks a month? Support the show. I mean, we do get less than one in 100 people that support the Gramerica show. So, if you want to be special, one percenter, head over to grandmaker.ca slash support. Send some value back our way today. And we are being censored. I mean, it's not easy oh right God. now. We got another strike on YouTube from some, like, a year-old episode. Um, Darren's Twitter. What is it? Your Twitter is also suspended now? Like, give us, a, give us a little, give us a little, uh, don't you have a, it, yeah. isn't there a jingle for this, like, the cancellation segment? You want to hear a weird synchro? Yeah. Is I just published not that Benny Wills convo, but one of our older Benny Wills convos. The first time we had him on the show, yeah, on the Grand Mary Comedia channel, like two days ago. Wow! Like almost down to the day that they deleted that, and then that's the one that they deleted, and then mm. that's the one that uh, they deleted. So, I mean, it's a weird little. I don't know. It'd just be the social media jingle. I mean, remember when it was? It used to be such a fun jingle. Bingo, bingo, social media jingle. Don't forget to rate, comment, and or subscribe. Now it's now it should just be like. <laughs> now there should be like a rip terror sound across it. Just like yeah, there you go. That was ad lib. Oh, no, it's our uh, cancellation jingle. So, what's going on with Twitter now? Well, I had that backup account going for a while. And it seemed all right, but they nuked it now. And you know what? So, I started like, I'm taking some screenshots of some of the shit that some of these people Good. Yes. were saying. Some celebrities who I won't mention here yet, some queers. Self described from the LGBTQ community that seem to be able to say whatever they want to a certain section of Twitter. But this Indian can't bitch at the very politicians that have been oppressing him for a hundred years or more. So I sent a big, long, drawn out email. I mean, you know me, I can be, I can like talk some shit when I want to. So, uh, some empty threats. Is this from your old account? This is trying to get your old account My back, old though, right? Because remember, okay. Mac has said to just keep trying, but I kept trying to like, fuck off, man. Like the last time I emailed them, they responded in like six hours. And they're like, no, you're not getting your account back. I mean, it wasn't like that. It was that same automated message. So then I sent them this long drawn out thing. I played the Indian card. I said, you know, what the fuck? And, uh, and I said, if you're going to kick me off, at least show me the fucking exact tweet so I can compare them to the shit I got. Yeah. And see if it's comparable. Or why I got kicked off. And if I got kicked off by the gov- because of the, be- the behest of the government, I want to know that as well. Behest of yeah. Because the that's my theory. It's because it's, it's the Canadian government that is actually forcing Twitter to do this. And we know they've been... You know, they know all the other governments too, right? They're all pushing Twitter to certain things. And they're saying, don't let anybody insult our politicians. And I said, if you can't give me all that stuff, then I guess I'll see you in court. Which, you know, I can't afford to, 
to do. But I mean, what's his name? There's there's precedent for for getting your account back. Well, we had forty thousand. You know, whatever. What? How many did you have when you got canceled? Forty. Uh, I was at thirty-eight, or th- I think I was at thirty-nine thousand. So I thought you made it over forty at one point. I was up to forty-four for a while, but then I just started like. Once we were really, it'd be interesting to see where we'd be at now because the followers were just, you know, in free fall for a while, using losing a dozen or two dozen a day. Now that could have been accounts getting deleted, people leaving Twitter. Who knows? And the yeah, and the problem well, is you've you know, know used that for so long that uh, it becomes a a pretty good way to get a hold of people. I mean, now we've got to compete with email spam, and you're trying to get a hold of people on Instagram or email or. You know, you just don't have that like Twitter clout anymore. Instagram just straight up sent me a message that said uh, that Your account they, won't, is- they won't show my account to people that aren't following me already. <laughs> <laughs> and I was and like, what? honestly, I was like, weren't you already doing that? But so I've I've got an appeal up with them as well. And what about your Twitter appeal? You're know, not you're not your main cool. Twitter account, but what's what's how come they what did you do on your wrong on your new one? Your back. Oh, account? I don't know. They just figured out it was me. I think the going live, maybe. I don't know. They figured out it was me. That's what they I mean, they just said that's like this is you're evading our suspension policy. I'm evading my suspension. So that's when I went back to the original account and sent them the long drawn out email. Played the Indian card pretty hard threaten some court that I don't have the funds to back up. And uh, so, yeah, that's where I left that at. And then with Instagram, I did an appeal as well because they nuked me over the, them and Facebook both nuked me over. The Mackey's interview? No, Professor Teddy. I shared a picture of Professor Ted. Rest in peace. I rest his soul. Prescient. Uh, and it's all it said was a picture of Ted, like superimposed over his shed in the bush, and it said, "Get off your damn phone." That's it. That's Get the mean. You 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 broke up there. Get off what? Get off your damn phone. That's it. That's the mean. And they suspended you for that. They fucking hit the Facebook account and the Instagram account, and gave me a warning. On both accounts. So that was that extended your suspension on Facebook. A screenshot of the warning with the original post in it because I'm like, okay, it's got to be an algo thing that's just picking this thing up. And when stupid me, what I should have done is thrown some extra text in there somewhere so that the image wasn't down in the corner and still down like in its entirety because it was like a screenshot of the warning and the post. So the second I posted that, they boom, they nailed it again. So I got. Facebook finally, usually they won't let you complain, but they let me go to the appeal board this time. So, uh, did you play your card on that one? No, I didn't need to. I mean, the, the post wasn't that bad. I'm just like, what the fuck, man? There's a million posts going around about Professor Ted today. And you get mine, but I mean, they're watching my shit. Instagram, I have an appeal too. So we'll see. But they're watching my account because I gave that same meme to Shauna and she posted it and it's still up. The exact same meme. And not even that meme. Like an offensive meme. Like what some of my offensive shit. Because they came back and found a meme after the Maccas thing triggered everything. They went back and found <laughs> one of my more offensive memes from like six months ago. The zipper tits one. They found that. And I'm like, what the fuck? So, like, Shauna posted it? No problem. Is I Instagram it. again? No, this is Facebook. Oh, Facebook. Facebook is like, what I think, and, and Instagram, sorry, both. So what I think is I'm actually actively posting through a filter. Yeah. I'm, I'm in a net already that my posts need to make it out of. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, the ultimate shadow banning, but it's not really a shadow banning. It's just like they're fucking it's like a pre little thing. It's a pre that Other people are getting so I've like got tons of presents. Like they're right there, people are posting the exact same shit and and not getting in trouble. So 
I mean, I don't know what to say. And then we have the YouTube. So now we have the YouTube strike now. So our YouTube channel was back. We were reviving it. I was updating some of the old stuff. And now we're, we got a strike from a year old episode. So we can't stream there again. We've been streaming and doing video. So we are on Rumble and we are on Rockfin, both shows. And we won't be on Facebook or YouTube or Twitter for a few and, weeks. And Grey America Outlawed, our other complete other podcast, is on. Uh, and they nuked substitute. another one of the Kindle accounts. I mean, Jesus fuck. What a yeah. week. Yeah. Holy. We're and at a full so, halt here at Grey America HQ. We need your support more now. So hour. Substack too. Substack and, and locals for the outlawed videos, full full episodes and video. I have my Substack too. If people want to go to a Canadian shame.substack.com. Just me writing stuff about Indians. So and how terrible the government is. Yeah. <laughs> that could have I mean maybe they're they're like this fucker's stepping it up with a substack now too. Let's get them. Whatever. Can't keep it. Do you have any do you have a rat a tat tat update for us or no? I don't. I'm still waiting to hear back from the attorneys. Okay. I think it'll be a while now. I mean, this is gonna be a slow moving process. So I do have uh did you see the post? I bought a new gun. It's an old one that's never been fired. So a 30 odd six. I'm excited about that. I mean, it's just a hunting rifle. It was just an insanely low price that someone was like, do you want to buy this from my grandma? My grandpa died. My grandma's selling them off. I was like, oh, I got enough guns. <laughs> and he's like, 350 bucks. I was like, sold. <laughs> <laughs> I got a shotgun here for you. If you get your power, I got an extra gun for you. So you want to buy a gun. If you get your gun license, I will donate you your first gun. All right. And some rubber bullets. Well, I, I just want to this segment for you because you've been calling me a conspiracy theorist. Now I'm not saying it's not, it's not like a high end publication. I've never even really heard of them. The palladium governance futurism. I'm wondering, is that, that's not the one that that dude we had in the show was connected to that future one. But anyway, uh, the title of the article is, Complex systems won't survive the competence crisis. And that's an excellent breakdown. I mean, this thing's going back, because I'm saying it started over COVID. This thing's going back before. This thing's going back to even when those military ships back in 2017 started crashing into each other. <laughs> They're saying that was the start of it. Like, fuck it, we can't even do this kind of shit. You know, it's all, so uh, it's pretty interesting. It's a good read. It's, uh, it's in our Telegram. You're, you're breaking up. I don't know if it's your it's internet or whatever. Account. It's got to be the internet. I mean, I don't know. I'm eating the mic. Can can we can we get a link for the show notes on that on that? Uh... It's in the Telegram. Yeah. Can you put it oh, in the show yeah, notes yeah. for the Telegram? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it's. I mean, uh, it's. It kind of puts into words better than I've been able to exactly what I've been talking about for the last six months or so. So it's an interesting read. I mean, it's like the firefight that it go, talks about the fires in California from those shitty power lines and just like, because we just keep old, overloading old systems. And it sort of just talks about the exact same thing I'm talking about that our grand, our great, our grandkids aren't going to be able to run the systems that our grandparents built, which is a shame. So couple that with the fact that our leaders are idiots quote unquote leaders, not my leader, not your leader, but you know what I mean? The people that are allegedly running the country and the country's into the ground. And it seems like collapse in our lifetime is inevitable, which is a huge slice of humble pie. I mean, if we have John Michael Greer on the show again, I will have to apologize because I was rolling my eyes for his entire hour and a half discussion on how and why it was all coming down like eight years ago. And now I'm just like, oh man, he was on it. He was on it. Anyway, that's all I got. Well, I got, okay. I want to go back to this. That's conspiratorial, right? Yeah, no, it's great. Less and less of a conspiracy theory. Yeah, that's great. Somebody's like sort of articulated your, your position recently. Right. So I just want to read a little little bit of this uh, Arthur Kwan Lee. This is our latest guest from Gramerica Outlaw. He's a canceled Christian artist from Korea. Well, his uh, his heritage is Korean. He was born in the States. 
He's a great fucking artist. And uh, he just uh, had his sub stack come out here. He says, Christian censorship is off the charts. So he says, recently the censorship of Christians has been off the charts. Just this weekend, Michael Knowles and Candace Owens lost their YouTube channels while Tucker Carlson was sent a seasoned assist for his Twitter live show. Christians are the most targeted and persecuted demographic in the world. And mentioning any group whatsoever in the same breath is a total joke. Many say the target is conservatism. You're not looking into it deep enough. Trust me. This morning, I woke up to a rather disconcerting message from my primary social media platform I utilize being Meta, Facebook, and Instagram. It's been an incredibly disconcerting on and off relationship utilizing the Meta platform. Literally every week, I've received a new restriction or community guideline strike for being a slightly edgy, free-speaking Christian American. <clears throat> but so today... Much. Oh, go ahead. I thought you were done. Um, but today, that is a sin um, to the arbiters of the clown world and the brainwashed inhabitants who fall in line like a finger snap from the infinity gauntlet. The algorithm can erase your online relevance, erase years of investment financially and socially with incredibly powerful connections through the application. Speaking personally, having access to deeply insightful and influential men like Joe Rogan, Elliot Hulse, Ryan Mitchler, etc., was the primary perk of my growing Instagram account. There was tremendous value in the realm of artistic influence just by being associated with men of this quality. But all the reach, conversations, and followers I've met were flushed down the drain for a spicy, explicit content seen below. <clears throat> and he's showing his art, actually. Wow. Oh, yeah, I didn't realize that, uh, yeah, he was just showing his, uh, his art which is one of the, of the, uh, is it the resurrection or the, uh, huh? What do you, what do you call it when he's nailed to the cross? That uh, crucifixion, the crucifixion. <laughs> Frankly yeah. speaking, I'm tired of the conversation of cancel culture, but because nothing's changed, I must being blacklisted by the New York scene, the New York city fine art world for my public support towards Trump. Losing a huge residency opportunity for pointing out the hypocrisy of social justice at a dinner party and now losing over 10,000 followers for being unapologetically Christian that doesn't fit the stereotype they deem as socially acceptable. The lesson here is not to invest in an immoral infrastructure. The lesson is to go further into independence and drop the social camouflage. The lesson is to only paint for those who believe in you in the first place. So once again, for the sixth time in my career as a counterculture Christian crusader, I'm pivoting due to authoritarian censorship. So there you have it. <clears throat> that that episode caused a little bit of controversy. I got some emails. Um, maybe I'll, I'll save those for for next week. Some email feedback. But yeah, that was a that was a great episode in Great America Outlaw. It was our recent uh, release. As long as we're here, here's a little list of the posts that have got me kicked off of uh, Instagram or got my account to the. I'm now at the you're close to losing access to your account status. I can't be seen by non-followers. I mean, the one just is a picture of a chick. She might have just been doing something a little unsavory. But the he the caption is just when you clear a fat dab in one rep. You know? I mean, it seems subtle enough. But this is... So those that there's a... I lost the review on that one, too. And I lost the review on the Robin Williams one. Uh, one of the other ones I lost the review on, though, but this one's quite interesting, is a quote from Zipporah Menashe that says, You know very well, all the stupid Americans know equally well that we control their government. Irrespective of who sits in the White House, you see, I know it and you know it, that no American president can be in a position to challenge us even if we do the unthinkable. What can they, the Americans, do to us? We control Congress. We control the media. We control showbiz. We control everything in America. In America, you can criticize God, but you can't criticize Israel. So I got hit for that one, the Teddy one. So the one of the mustaches with the vagina snuck in there. You know, some ones that maybe I could see getting a, a slap on the wrist for. But then the other one was just a picture of the sign in Vancouver of the, all the drugs that they're selling now, commercial. <laughs> it's a picture of their sign. And, uh, and this is this is why it's going to collapse because they can't, the algos can't do all this stuff properly. 
That's so what's I happening. Got down for a picture of their sign because they're selling cocaine, crack cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, and MDMA. They're selling all this in Vancouver now, off the street to anyone who walks in, which I predicted, and you told me I was wrong. What? What do you mean I What's told you? you I was wrong? What? I thought it was you. Maybe it was someone else. No, because I was telling that, you there's mushroom. I was telling you there's mushroom mushroom dispensaries. I was wrong with that because you called that like a few years ago. And I was like, no way, not in our lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> now you can buy crack cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even have to cook it yourself. You could buy fucking crack cocaine. We got to do a show on harm reduction. We should. And addiction, yeah. If anybody knows somebody that's talking about addiction and harm reduction, let me know. I've tried to get a, a hold of a bunch of people. All right, guys. Do you have a bio? Do you have a bio? I do, yeah. Ian Williams is an educator, speaker, business advisor. Through mindfulness, systems thinking, and regenerative design, he empowers the growth and development of individuals and communities. As a business advisor, he fosters healthy organizational cultures through process optimization, wellness integration, and environmental restoration. He dedicates himself to humanitarian and environmental endeavors to generate systematic cha systemic change for common good. These core values are rooted in the waters and boreal forests of Minnesota, but a single mystical experience prompted his awakening to spirit. This led him to a devoted path of service, seeking justice for the people of the planet. And the book that we're talking about is Soil and Spirit, Seeds of Purpose, Nature's Insight, and the Deep Work of Transformational Change. And it's at reviveyouandi.com. You as the letter U. Is that the bio too? Yeah. That was it. All right, guys. I mean, this one gets a little fun. I mean, we get, we argue a little bit almost. I, mean, I wouldn't call it arguing, but some definite debate. Join the chat. Ian Williams. Welcome, Ian Williams. How you doing? Doing well. Thanks for the opportunity. Happy to be here. Yeah, yeah. This will be this will be fun. Like we were talking about earlier, this uh, book of yours, Soil and Spirit. It's a it's an interesting interesting book. I love the the spiritual aspect of it. The kind of like take responsibility aspect of it. So, we'll uh, looking forward to jumping in there with you. Let's go for it. So, did, I thought I'm, I saw something in there um, about your you had like a spiritual experience or epiphany i can't remember what you called it on uh, on sort of the the genesis of this and i love starting off with this because so many of our, our of our guests and and people that have done you know books or research projects have started out with something like that yeah yeah yes uh mystical experiences i think I, what i termed it in the book um not that the book dives deep into it for any listeners out there but yeah i was 24 so this is 2013. Um, for those that want to do the math, I guess that shows my age. Ten years ago, yeah. Yeah. And um, had a dog. She was a beautiful pit bull uh, for probably about six years up until that point. And she was just a little bit unstable, like some dogs are. So there was a number of people bites, animal bites, dog fights over the years. And there was one in particular that just kind of like put the kibosh on all of it. And it was a battle royale in the hallway of our apartment building. And um, there was a few of us out there in the hallway, probably like 15 minutes trying to break up this dog fight. Eventually we did, got back into the apartment. She's got blood all over her face. I got blood all over my hands. And she just looked at me with those eyes like, what next? 
Like for her, the moment was totally gone. And for me in that moment, I knew I can't keep doing this. Like I can't provide for this dog in the way that I need to in order to provide the quality of life for her. And her quality of life is affecting my quality of life. And at this point, as a family, we had done just about everything we could. Um, as a dog family, we had done just about everything we could to keep her around. So we made the difficult decision to let her go early. She's probably six or seven. Um, she was a rescue, so we don't really know. So we put her down December 30th of 2013. And then like four or five days later, I was laying awake in bed one night and I was staring at the ceiling, thinking about the dreams that I was having, thinking about my life. And she nudged the door open and I could feel her energy come into the room and she hopped up on the bed next to me. And I turned and I looked and I could see her and I could hear her breathing, but she didn't make an imprint on the mattress. And it was so soon after we let her go that I didn't think anything of it. You know, it was like still normal to have her in the house. Uh, so anyway, I rolled over next to her and she curled up next to me and she sighed like that patented sigh. It's time to go to sleep. And I fell asleep. And I woke up the next morning and I was journaling about it because I thought it was a dream. And I was writing down my dreams at that point just as means of processing. And it was while I was writing about it that I realized I was awake when that happened. You know, I had no... I had no way of wrapping my head around that experience. It was so far outside the realm of possibility for me. So it kind of just blew the doors off what I thought reality was or could be. And that was really the turning point for me. You know, like somebody said to me the other week, so you got visited by the ghost of your dog. I was like, I guess that's one way to put it. Yeah. I've never, <laughs> I've never thought about it that way, but like, yep, that's pretty much it. Did it, did you get the sense that everything was all good? I mean, cause it must be, it's a difficult decision putting an animal down. Like you're like, do you, you know, do you let it suffer for a while? Do you like, it's, it's tough. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think we all interpret many things out of experiences like this. Right. But every night we'd sleep together and she would always let out that sigh. And it was like, I'm ready for bed, you know, and she was relaxed and she wasn't a very relaxed dog by and par by and large. So at night when she would sigh, she was ready for sleep. She was relaxed. And it was that, that same message, that same signal that she gave me. Um, so certainly that's part of what I take from it. Yep. An opportunity to just let it go. So how does that experience play into like the next part of your journey and, and the book? And Yeah. Next, the next decade of my life. I mean, I woke up the next morning and I, like I said, I was writing about it and I realized I got to, at the time, I got to go figure this out. You know, I got to like make sense of this. And it just so happened that the very next week I was going to be attending my first yoga class. Um, so I knew, I guess, for a little bit of context for the listeners, like at this point in my life, when this experience happened, I was probably using substances for like 10 years prior to. Um, so, you know, as a background in addiction, I'm now seven and a half years sober. But at the point, at that point in time, I knew I had enough self-awareness to know like this dog occupies so much space in my life. And if I don't intentionally fill it, I know it's just going to be filled with more drugs and alcohol and I don't want to do that. So I had made some like preemptive decisions, right? Just, like signed up for a marathon, started running, um, tried to start making changes to my diet, was journaling a lot, going to therapy, et cetera, et cetera. One of those things was yoga class. So I had this experience, was signed up to go to my very first yoga class the next week and it was really just the beginning of, you know, what I would call a spiritual path, right? In the sense of, I need to go make sense of this, which now I look back and I think that was a pretty naive perspective to have around it, right? It's hard to make sense of something so profound or mystical. But that led to yoga. That experience led to yoga. Yoga led to meditation. Meditation led to Qigong. Qigong led to martial arts, Tai Chi. Like I just kind of went all in on the Eastern energy arts. Um, and that really defined and has defined in many ways the last 10 years of my life. So it was, you know, we could say the first step in the book, but it happened a long time ago. I didn't start writing the book until like two and a half years ago. A lot of stuff has transpired since then. I got to tell you about this experience I had in, in treatment and recovery with Qigong. I was, uh, <clears throat> I was in there for cocaine and alcohol addiction. That's so it's just, I just passed my 15 years a couple of months ago. And, uh, finally finally ready to do the qigong class that was in this place every morning and i was also reading uh eckhart tolle's book uh, the new earth at the time mm -hmm. and i was like picking out spots to read for people like in, in the group classes and stuff like that i was i was a total geek in there 
<laughs> but I finally went to Qigong. And then after that night, I had a really good Qigong session. I was like, holy fuck, this is amazing. And I open up that book and I look down, randomly opened it up and looked down. And the word I saw was when I looked down was Qigong. I was just like, holy shit. Yeah, it totally blew me away. Big synchronicity. Yeah. Those, uh, I mean, when you start paying attention, those synchronicities happen, synchronicities happen more and more. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, um, so how did you, how did you, I mean, what, how did, what took you towards writing the book then? Like if that's been the last couple of years, three years, then what, what about before that? Honestly, it was, it was the reason that I wrote the book was impetus. It was largely other people encouraging me to do it. Um, I'm a big picture thinker. I'm a systems thinker and I'm really interested in trying to be a part of solving these global challenges like climate change and social justice, et cetera. And so I'm always kind of head up in the clouds and, you know, for you having gone through 15 years of recovery at this point, like it's one thing to get sober, but it's another thing to start processing the emotional content, which is why you started using in the first place. So for me, that journey of, you know, this experience, first yoga class, and then in the subsequent year, starting to get serious about my sobriety, um, I had to do a lot of that self-awareness, a lot of that self-reflection, a lot of that processing through um, the emotional content, the somatic stuff. And as I was doing that, I would share the experience with other people. I would share the insights that I'd learned about myself and the connections that I had made about, you know, hey, this thing from my past manifested in this way in, in my present. And now here's what I'm going to do about in the future. And I just had enough, enough people ask me like, well, where'd you learn that? Where did you come across that? How did you discover that process? Who taught you that? And the answer was always the same, like just came from within. I don't know. I just sat down with a pen and a pad and, or I sat down in silence or I went out into the natural world and I just came up with it or it came out of me. And after I'd heard enough people say like, you should really find a way to put this in writing, to teach this to other people. That was really kind of the impetus of the book, but it was, you know, seven or eight years in the making. Um, in the beginning, shortly thereafter, you know, going deep on the energy arts at that time, all I was really doing was I was still processing intellectually, but I was, I was building what I would call like a toolkit to experience my physical body and my emotional content, because at the time I didn't have the skills to do it, right? Like something would be uncomfortable would come up and I just go get high and I'd check out. Right. So it's not really like a skill. It's just a compulsive habit. Um, so as I started to process through all that stuff and started to build the skills to be able to be in relationship with my body, um, that just led to a more subtle understanding of self and life. And so that path, that discovery path, self-discovery path, eventually led me out of my career and into the one that I'm in now, uh, led me back into school, totally transformed my social group, um, and eventually led to the book. You know, it's kind of a, a convergence of many things, but it all started with that self-discovery and curiosity process and just continuing to tease the, th the, the thread and follow the breadcrumb trail. Can you, can you talk about how you incorporated that sort of personal internal journey into the book, which is kind of about, you know, soil and spirit and the, and the planet and sort of us taking care of things on a bigger picture a little yeah. bit better. Cause it's, it's, it is, I like the way you kind of interwove that in there. Yeah. I mean, again, for the listeners out there, like the book is not, the book is not about me at all. Um, it's a, it's a big picture book. It's a big idea book. But the central thread of the book is in order to address these grand challenges, we need to go inward and do our own personal work, right? That self-discovery. So this kind of, like I was talking about the uh, many things converging at the same time, it was this personal discovery piece. It was the spiritual practices. And then it was a lot of time spent in nature, you know, time in nature was integral to my healing process. Um, and so what I mean by that is a lot of the lessons from nature, we can apply to our own personal and spiritual development. So for example, like one that I often start with that's easy to think about is diversity in nature is actually what creates resilience, right? So for anybody out there who has a, a lawn in their front yard, they know how difficult it is to keep the weeds from moving in, right? Or if you think about industrial agriculture and growing crops at scale, the single crop at scale, it takes a lot of energy to suppress mother earth's natural tendency, which is to create diversity, right? 
the same thing internally for us. When we create monoliths or monocultures in our own life, then we're suppressing our natural processes. Um, so it's these three things, right? Nature, spirituality, self-discovery. And you might say that those last two are one and the same, but for me, they were a little bit different, at least in the beginning. Uh, so the book is really meant to address, it's meant to lay out a linear path for the reader that walks them through how to be a part of the change without doing anything externally, but rather starting with that inward journey, right? So there's four sections to the book. And if you've read it, then you know, like there's the internal landscape, social landscape, external landscape, and spiritual landscape. The idea is that if we want to create change in the outer world, we need to create change in the inner world. But that's a pretty, I don't know, you might call it like esoteric or ephemeral process, right? It's not very tangible to say, go inward and do that inner work. My attempt with the book, Soil and Spirit, is to demonstrate the connection between the two. One is that there's a, there's a soil, there's a substrate, there's a foundation to the spiritual process. But the other is that our spirituality is intimately connected to nature, right? Yep. Yeah. Oh man. So getting out of nature, grounding, all that stuff, like, can you tease that out a little bit? Cause I've recently, you know, I was reading to my girlfriend, like this is, there's a lot of science behind this, especially in the last 10 years, like even just, just like the anti-inflammatory um, changes in your body from grounding the, uh, yeah. the pain management, like it really does make a difference. So it's not just like, you're not just talking about going out of nature. Like there really is a physical difference. Yeah, I mean, if anybody's interested in the science, just Google nature-based therapeutics. There's a whole field of research devoted to this, right? So you mentioned anti-inflammatory, um, stress reduction, pro-social behavior. There's all sorts of things. Uh, and it's it's pretty obvious when you think about it at a higher level, right? Because we co-evolved with nature. And so naturally, that's going to have an interplay in our health and well-being. Um but there's also now, and this is part of what's like, it's part of what I really enjoy about this time and this day and age in terms of science, because the science is starting to bear this stuff out. It's not just correlative anymore. We can actually show the causation, right? And so this terms of nature-based healing and the health benefits of nature, at this point, the argument is not really, does it heal? Is nature healing? It's to what extent, to what extent right? right? It's about dose and dosage. How yeah. much do we need in what form, yeah. what constitutes nature, et cetera. That's a good so, point. It seems to be accept, accepted now. Like I, I see it from more mainstream journals and stuff, even like the benefits of grounding. Like I, 10 years yeah. ago, that was all like very sort of woo woo, you know? Yeah. I mean, in it, you know, in some ways I feel like it often kind of parallels the whole biohacking field, yeah. um, which, which is, is interesting to me. And at the same time, it's a little too like scientific, and, techie, and I don't mean techie, that. In, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like it's not necessarily just because it's my cup of tea doesn't mean that it's not valid. That's not what I'm trying to say. But for me, my relationship with nature and the, the healing that came from it was much more of an intuitive process. You yeah. know? So like when I talk about nature immersion, it was taking a hike one day, getting lost in the woods and then up sitting underneath a tree for a couple hours. Right. And if anybody's ever taken the time to do that without the distraction of the cell phone or, or a book to read or anything else, like, if you sit there quietly along long enough, like nature will move back in around you, right? The birds will come in and the squirrels will come oh, in. Oh, interesting. You just become a part of the ecosystem. And after having that happen enough times, I realized I'm never separate from it to begin with. I'm right. only thinking that I'm separate from it, right? And so, you know, being from Minnesota up in the Midwest, we have the boundary waters. So when you get up there to the thousands upon thousands of acres of just wilderness, and all you have to do at night is, you know, sit on the shore and watch the sunset. Like that was really where I started to learn some of these lessons of acceptance and inclusivity because I felt a part of the landscape as opposed to, you know, this separate being who's walking on the earth as opposed to walking in the earth, if that makes sense to put it that yeah, way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I read this, a lot of this reminded me of Gordon White's book called Animistic as well, because he talks about this post-activism stage. So it's kind of like, you know, animism, but also from a mystical point of view. Mm. And he talks about how, you know, we are a part of nature. Like we are, we're not just separate, right? And part of the problem with the environmentalism movement is that it just treats us as totally separate. It's not, not a part of it. 
Did you find think, that at all as well? Because you talk about being like sort of one with nature, but we're also looked at as a disease in nature. Yeah. And, you know, we might say we are our own disease, right? Uh, like if you think about the environmental challenges, you know, or like one thing that I start the book off with is the six mass extinction, Yeah, yeah. right? Like it's knocking at our door and there's been five previous mass extinctions on planet earth, the most recent being the Jurassic, but none of them have ever happened by the hand of a species on the planet. Right. So what, so what is, have, can you dig in that a bit too? After, after you explain that? Yeah. Just the idea that the single idea that we are separate from nature has created the entire delta of environmental devastation that we now find ourselves amidst. This notion that we could supersede natural law, right? We can start farming in a way that's not natural to Mother Earth, or we can start traveling in a way that's mother now or extracting natural resources, right? I had a um, Lakota or Dakota elder years ago talk to me about that phrase, specifically natural resources, basically saying, you know, when you define the earth as a natural resource, you're defining it as a reservoir to deplete, to take from. And so a lot of this stuff is rooted in our psyche and our perception. We're looking at the world in a specific way because we see ourselves as separate from it. And that separateness, in my experience, leads directly back into the whole Eastern spiritual philosophy, right? About like non-identity, non-attachment. When we're not identified with ourselves, whether we're whether ourselves as an individual or a family or a community or as a civilization or a species, we recognize that we're always a part of the whole. So you know, maybe it's a bit philosophical, but that's again, going back to the science of the day and age, that's part of what I love about what's happening right now is because all this stuff is starting to be, you know, it's playing out scientifically and it's, you can't, you can't deny it anymore in that sense. What well, so what is the main, what is the main thing behind the six mass extinction then? So, well, tell me a little bit more. Like that we're, mm -hmm. that, that humans are causing a mass extinction of ourselves or of, of all species on the planet. Like how, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and how, I guess, how are we causing it in accord, you know, in accordance with the, the science that's there right now? I think it's really easy to oversimplify this conversation. So again, for all the listeners out there, please take it with a grain of salt, right? Cause we could easily spend the next week dialoguing about this and many conferences do. Um, loss of biodiversity is equating to, in many ways, uh, mass species die off. Like if you look at the extinctions list, there are dozens of species that are going extinct every single day. Um, and we can see it starting, you know, we're reaching a tipping point. If you think about, even if you avoid, you know, some of the mainstream, like thinking about the polar bears or thinking about, you know, the, uh, the plains animals that roam in the great Sahara, like even if we move, remove some of those like bigger keystone species that we're all learning about in second, third, fourth grade type of thing, looking around, you know, like I'm on a book tour right now, driving, driving an internal combustion engine. And I haven't been around on this planet a whole lot. Uh, you know, only a couple decades, but like, I can think back to a kid taking a road trip, just the windshield was covered in insect splatter. And I'm driving around now and it's like mostly clean windshield, right? So there's correlative stuff, but back to your question, more specifically, loss of biodiversity is key, right? As the human species expands in terms of population, that has also correlated with taking up more space. Of course, there's a conversation about global warming. And we could split that hair in a million different ways, but that is essentially resulting in increased volatility in weather patterns. And so I think it's easy for particularly, you know, those of us who live in the Western developed world to think, well, you know, climate change isn't happening yet. But the reality is if you talk to indigenous communities or coastal communities or people who live in the tropics, it's been happening for a long time. 
storms are becoming more severe. And eventually, if we keep pushing all these things towards that tipping point, the science tells us we're going to go past the tipping point. And it's not necessarily to suggest that like the meteor is going to strike and we're all going to be gone in a matter of a week. That's not necessarily what I'm talking about with the sixth mass extinction. It's, ne- it's, it's more a, a notion of we're turning this planet into something that will be inhospitable and not compatible with human life, right? We are essentially going to farm ourselves out of existence. And I, I use farm metaphorically, not literally in that sense. So, you know, the book, again, like right off in the introduction is, this is not a book that's trying to convince you of climate change. Like that's not even the conversation that I'm trying to have. The point is whether or not this stuff is real. And that's the other thing that, you know, I tried to be overt about in the book is like, no matter what your beliefs are, doing this inner work is going to be beneficial for you and others and the planet. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, that's the challenging part for me is like, the, I know we're destroying the planet. I just don't necessarily always believe we're destroying it in the way they, they say, you know, the way, the way I'm told I'm destroying it is going to be more money and taxes for me to, to help uh, fight an invisible sort of enemy kind of thing. And I don't, and I don't trust the the powers that be after the last few years. And now, now I'm, I'm asked to, you know, to, to comply with a bunch of other things that they say that they have the answer for. And, but I think the corporations are destroying the planet. I mean, I, in a lot of other ways, you know, chemicals and, and, uh, you know, the oceans. It's, and I mean, it, it's so I, it's, 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 uh, it's, a, it's a tough one. It's highly complex and it's interrelated, right? I mean, this is another, this is another lesson that comes directly from nature. It's natural law, this notion of interconnectedness. So the solutions, if we just call it climate change or really anything, social justice, anything else, they're existing at this kind of intersection of the private industry and sector, the public sector, and then us as consumers. And yeah. when you put those three things in a, in a melting pot together, you get a lot of complex problem solving, right? And so it's, it's far too easy to oversimplify this conversation it's far too easy to hope that there's going to be a silver bullet, you know, it's just that magic bullet that cures all. Yeah. Um, but I think to your point about, you know, ultimately making the change boils down to behavior modification and that exists on a spectrum for people. You know, some people are willing to do more than others. Some people are willing to sacrifice more than others. Bottom line is I think if we're going to see this through, there's going to be a lot of sacrifice required for a whole lot of people and predominantly that's going to be centered in those of us that live in the developed world, because we are the people who have consumed the most resources and we've become the most comfortable. Right. Yeah. And it's not to say that we need to go back to a tribalism. That's not necessarily what I'm suggesting either. It's a notion that we need to find ways to innovate, to build a regenerative future, right? Not one that's sustainable because if we sustain what we're doing now, the science tells us we're still heading for the cliff. But this idea that if we can build something that's regenerative, then we can actually move forward. Getting back to nature, working with nature. So that this is the other thing I have a hard time picturing. Like when would we have been working with nature in the past? Like we're extracting like huge megalithic stones thousands of years ago. We're logging like crazy, even primitive times. Like were they destroying nature or are we just doing it way worse in the last like three or 400 years since the industrial revolution, you know, like, cause, because when we're looked yeah. at as a, like a, a pariah on the earth, then, the, then we would have been looked at that like all the way back. Right. I mean, we're always using resources. I think it's a, I think it's a beautiful question. And, you know, perhaps the simple answer would be there's more of us. And I'm not yeah. suggesting that we're overpopulated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't but necessarily it's, it's, believe it's that's wider, the case. Yeah. But, you know, there's more of us. So naturally, we're going to consume more resources. We're going to have a larger footprint. At the same time, if everybody who, have, who had a lawn here in the United States turned that lawn into a garden, they don't even need to do the gardening themselves. Just hand right. it over to someone who does want yeah, to do the yeah. gardening. Yeah. Right? Like, a lot of our food and security issues would disappear yeah. overnight. Yeah. So the question about... I mean, I think the other thing that's really fundamental here is we need to recognize. We're talking about then just letting someone make a 
a farm in my lawn? Is that the extent of the sacrifice? Are we talking about a bigger sacrifice? And who's making the decisions for said sacrifice and who's making what sacrifices and who's exempt from those sacrifices? You know, can you kind of outline what that sort of looks like for me? So let's go back to that intersection of the private sector, the public sector, and then us as the consumer, right? Again, it's, it's too easy to oversimplify this conversation, but to Graham's point earlier, like, especially for the largest companies on the planet, massively resource consumptive. And so often the bill of goods that we're sold is, well, you as the individual or you as the family need to bring the reusable bag to the grocery store, drive less miles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And those things will all have an impact and certainly a larger impact cumulatively. But if we're looking at a Fortune 500 or a Fortune 100 company, the resource consumption at their scale is going to dwarf anything that we can do as a family or a small community. That relationship, yeah, of course, is directly. But ultimately, their production is still based on our consumption. So if you start limiting their ability yeah. to produce, that's going to affect my ability to consume. So, I mean, depending on what industries those are, uh, you know, what, what, I guess at the end of the day, what I want to know is what personal freedoms am I sacrificing to, to, for the greater good? Because that's what it boils down to is, is I'm going to lose a certain level of freedom that I'm used to so that the, so that the world can be better off if I'm understanding that. I mean, cause that's ultimately what the sacrifice is going to amount to, right? or is it just giving letting the neighbor that wants a bigger garden use my front lawn because i mean i can get on board with that they could farm it they can give me 20 percent. you know we can figure something out for that but if someone's telling me how far i can drive my car and where i can drive my car or what kind of car i have to have that starts to blur some lines for me on mm-hmm. because you know if i if i sacrifice the car to this to the electric one sure that's great but now ultimately the the state is deciding where i can go with my car because if there's not a charger within you know this many hundreds of miles of where i'm at then i'm i can't go there anymore so mm-hmm. you know i guess that's i'm i'm not willing to really give up any more of those freedoms as an indigenous person living in Canada, because, you know, I feel like I've given up enough freedoms, you know, and not just me, all Canadians have given up enough freedoms. It's just sort of been this slippery slope towards less freedom for 155 years. So are we able to implement that without, without sacrificing the very thing that makes us the West, which is our freedom, arguably? Not even arguably. I would say that you can't even argue that point. That has been the selling point of Western civilization for a hundred years or more. See, at least since World War II, you know, we were the free and blah, 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 and they were not. And before that, that's been the selling point for America, at least, arguably Canada and Western Europe as well. So I would, I mean, your point is well taken. And I would say, First off, Darren, like I would challenge the concept of freedom. And this goes back to my notion about like, do we actually exist outside the bounds of natural law? Because the concept of freedom here in the West is essentially rooted in colonialism, which is this command, control, conquer paradigm, right? And so if you look at capitalism, which is the underlying economic model of the West, what you effectively have is an infinite growth paradigm on a planet that has finite resources. Why Assuming that we're using those why resources. Why does need to have an infinite growth paradigm, though? Why can't it just sustain at some level? I mean, it, it's, being, it's being sold like that in a debt-based society that needs to keep creating more debt. But I don't feel like capitalism could be blamed for that. If we go back to capitalism at its fundamental level, that's just the ability for me to exchange my goods to other people without other people getting involved in the, you know, that they just, 
and I can make some money doing that. And so I guess, I don't know what the question is there, but I don't feel like capital. I feel like capitalism gets blamed for a lot of problems that maybe aren't capitalism's fault and might have more to do with the state getting involved and controlling sectors and playing favorites yeah. and things like that. Right. But where I'm driving, where I'm driving is not necessarily that capitalism is the, the fundamental challenge. Capitalism is undergirded by human nature. And that's this whole, that's the whole concept of the book, right? Is that in order to effectively address some of these grand challenges and injustices in the world, we can't rely on institutions and governments to do the problem solving for us. And if we as individuals are going to be part of that change, if we're going to be our own effective agents of change, in order to be most effective, we need to go through our own self-actualization process. Right. And so I don't necessarily think that you and I are on different pages. I think we might be screaming at the same moon from different sides. Right. To Graham's point or to your point earlier about if the uh, if the company is limited in terms of what it can produce, then we're limited in terms of what we can consume. I agree. But the other thing that I think is at play here is this notion of human nature and, and more specifically perspective and perception. We can choose to perceive this as a loss of our liberties, a loss of our freedom. The challenge with that argument for me is that we all define liberty and freedom differently. And from a spiritual perspective, there's a, there's a line in the sand. This has been my experience at least where it's one thing to have a conversation about rules, regulations, laws, etc., and how those impact our daily lives. And I don't think that we can necessarily argue that systemic oppression exists. On the other side of that line, there's no institution, governing body, relationship, person, etc., that can prevent us as individuals from turning inward and diving deep into that, that's the soils of self, right? And doing that self-discovery process. And so to tie this back to this notion of responsibility. For me, the personal realization was, as I was doing my own self-discovery, the more insight that I have into my human nature and the more insight I have into how I'm impacting the world around me, the more responsibility I have to show up and take care of the world around me. And so back to, your, back to that specific word freedom and my challenge of it, it's not that I'm one definition of freedom could be this definition right in the West. But I would question and potentially even argue, is it really freedom in the first place? Right? Because if we're still as individuals, not even talking about societies, if we as individuals are still stuck in our own compulsive behaviors and ideologies and psychologies, are we truly free? And so for me, that's why this is a spiritual process. I mean, I can't, it's hard to argue. I can't argue with that. I'm not interested in arguing with that. I mean, if, if we had better people, then all of the isms would work just fine. I would still pick capitalism over other people telling me what to do, you know, because I want to limit that as much as possible. So if I can maintain my level of personal sovereignty throughout the the thing, then you know that's something that we can we can talk about. But I think I just think my personal opinion is that our best our best chance of getting out of what you know, and I'm not I don't want to take this as a, an argument that I'm I agree with with man-made global warming because I'm just not going to get involved in that right now. I don't, but it's not a conversation that we need to have right now. But I really think that capitalism is ultimately our best way of finding our way out of this. You know, we got away from using coal plants and stuff like that because of people just 
constantly trying to outcompete each other with innovation. On that point, if you can get me an electric truck that will go fucking fifteen hundred miles, you know, uh, let's and no one's allowed to hack into it and change anything. It's not even connected to the fucking internet at all. Period. It's my truck. I've paid for it. It goes fifteen hundred miles on a charge, and I can put some gas in it if I want in case I'm in a jam and I get stuck someplace. You know, then I I'm happy to go electric. But the market has to fucking get there first. I don't want to be forced onto a market that's sub substandard to the the level of where we got now because I'm worried that that just slowly, you know, Atlas shrugs back into a society yeah. where we're just fucking stuck in these little corners. And that inevitably turns into tribalism. You know, that's the part they don't get to in Atlas Shrugged is if you go a thousand or fifteen hundred pages past each other past the end of the book those fucking states are fighting each other and shit again because that's ultimately what the cycle is going to come to when there's not enough this or there's not enough food or there's not enough you know it's it's good that's or unless something changes in what seems to be the history of the world that hasn't changed on a cycle for the last at least recorded history i don't see i, I just i don't know that's exactly the point that I'm trying to make in the book, right? Is this boils down to human nature, right? In order to solve these problems, let's not even define them as problems. In order to create a space where everyone has the right to pursue their own liberation, We can enhance that right through the social systems and environmental systems that we create. And so to the point about the electric vehicle, right? Let's, let's zoom out a little bit. To your point about um, innovation, I agree with you. You know, there's a, like in terms of my day job and the work that I do with organizations, I very explicitly decided to try and work with innovative companies that are largely building tech solutions to solve big challenges, right? Because in order, to, in order to scale those solutions, we need innovation. And the free market, at least in my experience and observation, moves faster than the public, right? Moves faster than the government. And so in order to address those things at scale, in the time frame that the science suggests that we uh, need to address them on, then in my opinion, that's where I can have the greatest impact, right? I don't necessarily have any desire to walk into Congress and start lobbying. Um, it's not my area of expertise. It's not my area of interest. But the reason that I learned that is through that self-discovery process, right? Through knowing my own internal nature. And so this is precisely what I'm talking about. Like, I don't necessarily think that you pursuing your liberty infringes on my ability to uh, pursue liberty. At the same time, we need to be able to have that conversation in tandem with the systemic oppression that does exist and has existed because it's also a part of human nature. Yeah, that's a good point. And the electric car one is happens to be a pretty good example because there's a, there's going to become a resource problem with that too. It's not the fi it's not the Absolutely. final solution. It's not the final solution, so it's absolutely uh, yeah. It's it's an interesting quandary. My horse comes with a resource problem. You know what I mean? <laughs> if, there's, if there's not enough fucking water stops between point A and point B, you're not going to point B unless you're hauling the water with you somehow. You know, in the winter, it's a whole. You know, it's there's like that sort of limit on it all. I just I'm I'm happy to adapt along with society. As long as it's not forced upon me, which is the problem I'm starting to see in some of the yeah. different corners of the world. Like, we're going to do this, and you're not going to have a choice, and we're going to do that, and you're not going to have that shit anymore. It's like, okay, well, you know. It's a, it's a fascinating thing because we're, we're, we talk about spiritual stuff all the time on the show and nature and getting back to that and solutions and colonialism, colonialism and all that. And Darren, I mean, Darren's pushed back against, you know, our government for, you know, as a, as an Indian written some books and stuff on it. And, uh, but we're in a, we're in a weird spot where my, my main 
concern is now trust, like trusting the authorities and, and what science is what now. I mean, because it's pretty easy to kind of just take whatever data you want and form your own opinion or keep your same opinion. I mean, it's really hard to trust. You know, they want to block out the sun. I mean, we just had Jackie Jolie on. We just released an episode with Jackie Jolie and she talked about the importance of the sun and she does a really good job at talking about the circadian rhythms and how important it is to to really get out there and, and get that light. Not, you know, we're just living indoors now, right? So we never get that light and how that'll change your body. It'll change your your whole mechanism. You can sleep better and, and how important that is. And yet they're seriously talking about blotting out the sun or at least, you know, covering it up. So... Like, I just don't trust that. Don't block, don't block out the sun. Like I just, there's got to be other solutions. There are other solutions. At the same time, I think that we're at a point in the evolutionary process where we're just in one of those like generative phases where we need to throw as many ideas at the wall as possible. Yeah. hundred years from now, they're not all going to stick. Yeah. yeah. Right. And this is, this is the wheel of evolution. Yeah, right? and I'm okay with brainstorming and throwing ideas out there, but when it's the, when it's the most powerful people in the world throwing I, I, those ideas out there, I just don't trust it. And well, and this is this is what brings me back to my point. Like, like we can have a conversation about uh, systemic oppression and injustices. We can have a conversation about an infringement on liberties. There's no conversation to be had about us turning inward and, and doing our own self-liberation. Right. There's no body out there. There's no governing body or agency or company or anything out there that prevents us from doing that work. Yeah. That prevents me from reaching out to Darren and saying, hey, do you want to farm my front yard? Because I don't, but I'm sick of mowing it, right? And I can see it be putting, put to better use. There's nothing that's preventing that. And that, that's a process. That's an inward journey. Right. And so it's easy to get caught up in the narratives of the day. And this, I think, from a from a human nature standpoint, like it, it, it shines light on the fact that we are still predominantly processing the world intellectually. And to bring this conversation full circle back to my mystical experience, there was not a damn thing that was intellectual about it. Yeah. It was entirely experiential. And that's what changed my reality. And so I I fundamentally agree. Like it's difficult to have these conversations at this point, and there's a number of reasons why. But the bottom line is, this is an experiential process that we're going through, and as we can, so long as we continue to choose to approach life and problem solving and relationships with others and conversations, etc., primarily through our intellect, we're limiting ourselves because it's only one facet of the body. Right? There's the physical body, emotional body, mental body, spiritual body. If we integrate a more holistic intelligence into this process, into ourselves, if we awaken that within ourselves, then we're going to have more tools and resources and ability to address these challenges outside of ourselves. Yeah, and even use discernment. I mean, discernment is a big one that can come from that process. Yeah. You know, not, not becoming, sort of seeing yourself becoming emotionally attached to certain, certain narratives. I love it. I love it how you, you know, you talk about, and I think this is a major issue too, is that the materialistic, the materialism, you know, the, which is sort of, you know, overlaps with the colonialism. You mentioned that in your book a little bit, but I, I would think it's, um, it's, it's somewhat separate, but the materialism, the, uh, the site, you know, the, how, how much do you think it plays a role that like this, that the, the general science right now doesn't believe that we have a soul or a spirit or that we can't, you know, that we don't have, we don't live beyond, you know, cause, cause that's a core problem to me. It's a core, core issue with, with talking about living with nature and doing our inner work is like, we're not just, you know, a meat suit, you know, we have other abilities, we have other powers, we have other perceptions. Like how much of a problem does that play? Do you think? I think it's probably only a problem for those who haven't experienced these things for themselves. Right. Like, but, 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 but they want to hack us now, right? They're like human beings can be hacked. There is no soul. I mean, these the people are saying that. 
I mean, you know, I think everybody's got to be discerning in terms of what information they take in, right? And it is like, it's honestly one of the bones that I have to pick in terms of the uh, extremely scientifically minded conversations and narratives that are out there because empirical data will never be will never be able to empirify the entire world yeah right like it's just not possible and and you can even look at this right i mean this is science right the moment you look at that subatomic particle it changes yeah so there's just simply no way to classify the entire world because it is an evolutionary process and it's the same with the self and so to be in a position where you know i guess i would just go back to this this concept of like it's it's predi- the narrative is being predominantly driven through intellect and it's not that there's anything wrong with the intellect it's just a matter that I, it's like it's out of balance right it's so heavy intellectually and there's not a conversation around there's not as much a conversation around these other aspects of intelligence at the same time you know like we started off the conversation it's beautiful that there's a field of nature based therapeutics that is studying the empirical science and data of the healing capacities of nature right so you're always going to get the yin and the yang together it's the way it works yeah i i love that in gordon white's book he talks about there's a there's a an indigenous guy in us and i think it's in new zealand and and he's trying to figure out what to do with this uh this old sort of mound there's an old like an ancient sort of mound there and he sits in on this hill for six months, every night for six months to try and figure out like, how do we work with nature with this? Like, and, and he's told to build another one, but he's told the exact dimensions and everything of how they, how they used to be built. So he goes along this process of building it like, you know, within nature. Right. So it just, it just, I love I love the story. I love that that, that, that there is a way to communicate or to commune with nature, you know. Um that but how do we silence ourselves? And that's that intel I think that's that intelligence you're talking about. Yeah. I mean the body is a tuning fork, right? And the mind is just one part of it. The body is receiving these signals all the time. You know, like I just heard this beautiful example the other day. Think about the radio. You're on the wrong channel, you hear static. You dial into the right channel, the song appears. Well, the song was there before you got to the channel. But could you perceive it? No, like it wasn't in your field of awareness, right? The body's a tuning fork. It's always receiving these signals. And there's intelligence at deeper and much more subtle layers. And it takes a certain amount of devotion to self-cultivation to be able to start to interpret those layers, right? takes devotion to sit on a hillside for six months, right? Seeing something through, like writing the book was a two and a half year process for me. I learned a hell of a lot about myself because what I realized was, aside from my sobriety, there's nothing else in my life that I've committed to, to that extent, to that depth, right? To see something through that, that much, that far. These are things that we just don't experience. We won't know them until we, until we devote ourselves to them. And that's part of the beauty of it, right? Like like that's part of the mystery. And I think this goes back to like the exchange that Darren and I were having is it's a, it's, it's a lot about perception and how we choose to define the road ahead because we could choose to perceive it as loss and sacrifice, or we could choose to perceive it as something else. And that's a matter of personal choice as well. Well, we had a, we had a, a chat with somebody who made me really think about freedom in a different way because there was some people sort of following along with what they were told and that made them feel free. And I was like, this guy, he's making sense. Like some people feel freedom in a different way. If they're just, you know, led around and told what they're to do, that might make them feel free. Might make them feel free. free. I would argue. Yeah. But I mean, I but that comes down to perception, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. It doesn't make me feel free, but yeah, it's interesting. There's a difference between being free and feeling free. Yeah. How would you define the difference? Well, feeling free, a lot of things probably feel free that 
aren't, you know, my dog probably thinks it's free. It's not, you know, it, it's, it exists at my pleasure. My cats, you know, I let them come and go as they please, but they're still not really, oh, the cats maybe are kind of free, I guess. Maybe definitely freer than the dog because they could just wander off and never come back. I don't, I don't care about that, but, um, well, I guess like just what Graham described, if you're just let, if you've, if you're outsourcing all of your decision-making to other people, you might feel free, but I mean, that that's your right as a free person to do that. But you know, that's not actually being free. It's like being in a big enclosure, but you just never actually get to the walls because you're not interested in going that far. Mm -hmm. And I mean, to make it more literal for the individual, for the human, like, are we really free to choose what we eat and drink? Right. I mean, like we need that stuff to survive. And so is that freedom or is that bondage? Right. Yeah. And that relationship with food or with other people, is it, uh, a conscious intentional relationship. I'm not a huge fan of the word conscious because I feel like it's, it's become new agey. Mm -hmm. Like, is it an, an, is it an intentional relationship and are we aware of the totality of it or is there a certain part of it that's unconscious and therefore compulsive? We don't choose to get hungry. We're hungry because of our evolutionary DNA. Is that freedom? I mean, we could split these hairs in, you know, more than a million ways, but to be, this is why I think the conversation about experiential understanding and awareness is so important because the moment that we experience the moment that two individuals experience something to be the same, now we have an understanding. We're no longer debating ideas, philosophy, and dogma. We're having a conversation about experiential awareness and understanding. And I think that's just, it might be a subtle shift, but it changes the dynamic of the conversation. So I think an important thing to to touch on before we wrap it up is, uh, is this true north self-study, like how to find your purpose kind of thing. And it, once you do, do you have any advice for people that have sort of found that, what they think is that path? You know, I get asked this question on a regular basis. And if I think back to the book, I may have used a different phrase and I, I tried to be explicit in the writing that life is not necessarily about finding one thing and devoting yourself to that one thing. But I would say that true North is this pursuit of liberation, right? Self-realization. And once people have found it, I would say it's simply a matter of staying devoted to it. I think the more challenging component is the beginning of the journey, right? This notion of, so like Graham, you and I can use this as an example through personal experience, coming to terms with our addiction, right? I mean, you first have to just acknowledge this either is the way I want it to be or it's not the way I want it to be. Mm -hmm. And then once you acknowledge it, then you have to take the next step, which is choosing to do something about it. And that opens up a can of worms that you're going to have to see yourself through. And you might be able to find guidance and support in other people, but ultimately you're the one that has to do the work yourself. Right. And once you see that process through on the other side, the clearing becomes, I mean, it shows us a lot about ourselves, self-awareness, personal insights, spiritual discoveries, et cetera. And we can use those things to start to triangulate our quote unquote true north. What am I naturally good at? What am I passionate about? How can I be of service in the world? And then triangulate those things to find a place. And it's probably not going to be your perfect destination right off the bat, you know, or it's certainly not going to feel perfect, but it's the start of the journey. And so, you know, for people who ask me like, well, how do I get started on this personal discovery piece? The main thing I say is just commit, devote yourself to discovery, get curious, because the more that you learn about yourself, the more data and insight you'll have along the way. And then eventually you'll get to a point and there's a passage at the end of the book, which is no self, K-N-O-W, no self, N-O. 
right? You get to the point that you know yourself well enough that there's not really a self anymore, or at least you can start to experience aspects of life where you're like not as identified with your individual self. And that for me is where the fun starts. You know, that's where real life began for me. And I was just fortunate enough to have that start unconsciously. Right. I mean, like I was just fortunate enough to have that experience with my dog that just blew the doors off the hinges. And then all of a sudden my perception was radically different than the day before it literally flipped like a switch. Not everybody's fortunate enough to have that experience at the same time, you know, with all the research and practice of the energy arts that I've done, like we can all cultivate these skills to start to observe and be aware of the nuance and the subtleties. So that's a long winded answer, but I would say in the beginning, commit to that self-discovery process. And then once you feel like you have, you know, quote unquote, awaken, then the step becomes getting out of bed, devoting yourself to a life of service, whatever that means to you. Yep. That's good. Darren, do you have any questions for? No, that's good. I like that. That's, uh, I mean, I personal, personal sovereignty and person development should go hand in hand with each other. Um, as long as they're not fucking with other people's shit, you know, I'm hard to argue with that, with that, you know, I agree. Ian, do you have anything? Do you think that we touched everything? Do you, do you have anything else from the book you want to talk about? I mean, it's a big idea book for people who are interested in doing the work and, you know, hopefully a, a slightly different perspective than something that they've come across. You know, it's not, a, it, it is not a self-help book though it might be put on the bookshelf in that category in some bookstores. Um, it's really not meant to be that at all. It's not meant to be a one, two, three steps to a new you. It's a book about exploration. It's a book about having challenging conversations like this. Um, and so if someone, you know, feels like they're, if any of the listeners out there feel like they want to dive in and swim in that, that end of the pool, then I'd say, go for it, pick it up. I also feel like, you know, there might be a part two to this conversation down the road because it feels like there's a whole lot of stones left unturned that we could continue to explore. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, they need exploring. I mean, something's going to give eventually and uh, it'd be good to have some idea of what might work and what's broken. Yeah, that's a long conversation. And, uh, there's, Maybe next time we could get a little bit more focused in terms yeah. of what lane we're going to stay in. Yeah, because I agree, that. Darren. There's a there's a lot there's a lot to be discussed, and uh, there's a lot to prepare for, and and there's a lot to to question. And there's a lot in common because we all want to get back to nature. I mean that that's a that's a theme that's that's growing growing quite a bit with us and our listeners and stuff is the appreciation for nature and getting back to it. Beautiful. Yeah. Right on, Ian. Thanks. Where can, Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate the opportunity. Where can everybody find your book and your stuff? Yeah, you can get it on any online major retailer, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Goodreads, etc. cetera. Um, if you want to find it through my own website or if you want to contact me directly, it's www.reviveyouandi.com. It's the word revive, the letter U-A-N-D-I.com. And if you want to find me on social media, that's my same handle on all the major channels, Revive You and I. So reach out, find it, pick up a copy, send me a message, let me know what you think, leave a review. Um, I mean, this is the stuff I live for, conversations like this, hearing from people who've read the book, uh, debating, dissecting, exploring. This is this is what it's all about right here. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on the show, Ian. This has been fun. Appreciate it, gentlemen. Thanks, Thank buddy. you. Take care. Have a good night. You too. And that was a chat with Ian C. Williams. What do you think, buddy? Yeah, that was great. We got to do it again. Yeah, that was a fun one. I like his suggestion. Yeah, we should. We should. Uh, how do, are you doing a garden? Uh, well, yeah, no, but I thought Especially about it. Into planting season. I should, but yeah, just... it was like planting day. So they say not till after May long weekend in 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 Alberta. So. Well, same, same with Saskatchewan. It surprised me a little bit. They never, they never do that uh, until May long weekend. I always have a greenhouse. Yeah, I mean, you could do grain and shit. I think, but yeah, it could yeah. still snow 
I mean, it could still snow, but it probably won't. Yeah, no, it's. I think it was an intriguing book. I mean, I some of it sort of rubbed me the wrong way a little bit, but he wasn't very dogmatic in talking about that stuff. And I just, I really like his, you know, personal responsibility and the inner work part. I really think he would. I'd love to know what he thinks about that animistic book. It's a good book. That's one of my favorite books. Have you have you listened? Did is it on audio yet? Animistic. You got it. I have it on the shelf. Yeah. Have you read, read, have, read some of it? Yeah, it, yeah. You you'd love the audio version if they could if Gordon could get that done. What's it called? Animistic. Yeah, Anna dot Annie dot Mystic. A N I dot Mystic. I think he's going to do it on audio, but I just don't know when it is. I don't see it on uh, on there now, but I'm sure he will. I'm sure he'll be good. It's easier for me to listen for sure, but I should uh, read again. I do like. I mean, Gordon's Gordon work, yeah. Big thanks to Ian for coming on the show. Big thanks to you guys for listening. Even bigger thanks if you're one of our supporters, one of our people that help us keep the lights on around here. Year 10. I mean, we either we're probably just had our 10 year anniversary when you listen to this. It's probably come and gone, right? This isn't going to come up. I think, <laughs> I think this is going to come out right prior to our 10 year. Oh, really? Or we're about to have it. I think, yeah. Either way, head over to grandamerica.ca slash support today. Make one time donation or sign up for monthly or do something cool like that. Uh, it's a value for value show. So it is adding some value to uh, whatever you're doing while you're listening. Sign up today, you know, buck a month, two bucks a month. You decide. Other than that, head over to grandamerica.ca for everything we're up to. There'll be links to everything and all our other podcasts and audio books and trips in the show, in the menu there. Other than that, we love you guys. Thanks for listening. And we will see you next week. You might be. It's 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 the it's gonna come out after. I think. I think there's one in the can already. So.
Loose was dead and gone. 